So I'm going to talk to you and tell you about my life at Google, which was uh, probably one of the best working experiences I've ever had in my life. One of the things that we did at Google that no one else did at the time was we served free food every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. One of the things we also did, we didn't have a regular cyclical menu. No one knew about what was going to go on except me and my team. We didn't have a posted menu. You couldn't figure out your work week and say, oh, I'm gonna, I don't want to go there. It's Taco Tuesday or it's Indian Wednesday. When I, so we never released the menu until moments before noon. After a while there, I, I realized what my, my true role there was. It was creating the illusion that you were anywhere else but work. We would have these big barbecues. To any person that had never come to Google before and was visiting campus on like a beautiful summer afternoon, barbecues going, kegs of beer are flowing, people are playing volleyball, dogs are running around barking, people are laughing, children are having a great time. You would never think that any work got done there. But work got done there all the time. And one of the reasons why it was such a great productive place was the culture that we had created. But the things that I learned there at Google, it was like almost going back to get your master's degree. It was a whole different level of learning that myself as a chef was never exposed to. Because my title said executive chef, I would be invited to all these different meetings, marketing meetings, sales meetings, you name it. And I, I remember Omid Khorastani saying to one of the admins one day, why is Charlie here? Well, he's our executive chef. This is an executive meeting. Does he need to leave? He's like, no, I'm just curious. So I would stay and sit around and learn. I remember one day, Wayne Rosing came up to me and said, you know, you could do a lot more with ro robots if you had robots here. I said, oh, yeah? Robots. So Chowbotics is a company that I work with currently right now. And we build robots that make food. We don't replace people. We create work. So, you know, we've always had robotics for a long time now, but never in food. People think, oh, I don't want a robot making my food. Why, why don't you want a robot making your food? Our robot, Sally the robot, Sally the salad maker, she looks like a big vending machine. The interface is just like an iPad. We can make up to 50 salads at one time. When I started with the company almost a year ago, it was taking just about under a minute to make a salad. And I wasn't happy with that. We had to trim that down. So we had her in different workspaces all throughout the Silicon Valley and up in San Francisco. And you'd have 30 people in line. And if it's a minute for each salad, that's a half hour. You know, that's way too long for people to be waiting in line. So we've got it down now to 35 seconds. I want to get it down to 20 seconds. We've already sold hundreds of machines. Many tech companies in the Silicon Valley have bought the machines. A lot of the airline lounge management companies have bought the machines. A lot of the hotels have bought the machines. Mostly for pure convenience for the customer. Quick, fast efficiency. Each machine that we deploy to different clients, we create a different recipe protocol, depending on the demographics of the company. This one biotech firm in Emeryville, California, we place the machine, and majority, 85% of the employees there are East Indian. And we you know, did a survey with the company and found out what foods were most popular with them. Go figure, Indian. Um, so we, we created all types of flavor profiles for that machine. So each location, we really look at the different demographics and what's going to work best for that client. Why? It's quick, and it's efficient, and it's accurate. I use it every day. I could easily make myself a salad. Why? because it's one button. I push it, and I know the calories are correct. I'm a chef. I eat with my eyes. I'm going to make my, my portion too big. I don't want to get bigger. So something like Sally really helps someone that doesn't have self-control. So robotics aren't putting people out of work. Robotics are creating work. For this machine, you still need to have someone that chops the vegetables and, and all the toppings that go into the machine. You still need to have someone that can service the machine. You still need to have someone that will clean the machine. Human beings do all these things. When I did a story with the New York Times, that was the first question they asked me. So you're putting people out of work. 
you're stabbing your brothers and sisters in the culinary business in the back. How dare you do that? I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm creating work. I'm creating work that wasn't there before. You're not going to see robotics go away anytime soon, especially in the, in the food service industry. You're going to see it grow. People are like, well, why don't you just build a robot that has arms with knives? Well, those are very expensive. And when they have appendages, they move around, and you have to keep them in a contained area. A human being can't be near it. It's dangerous. So humans will always still be involved. Chefs aren't going away, because chefs are the ones that are the creative part of it. So you know, right now, I write all the different recipes for, for Sally. And the possibilities are endless, and it's really very exciting to, to see something that is disruptive in the food service industry that wasn't thought of before. You know, I use a lot of technology in my restaurant, and I, I had a digital tablet on my table before the iPad came out. Steve Jobs would come and eat breakfast in my restaurant every morning for four years before he passed away, and we weren't open for breakfast. So we had this conversation, this ebb and flow of, of what I was doing and what he was doing, and he gave me a lot of advice. And I remember when I launched this tablet with a couple MIT dropouts, we were the first co company in the United States to use these tablets. I know they had been used previously in Europe and Asia, but no one was doing that in the United States. And it drew a lot of attention. And a lot of the hospitality industry papers and, and magazines were writing things like, Charlie Ayers is not being hospitable. He's brought technology into the restaurant space where you want to engage with a customer and that, and that server. If you go out and eat every day, you don't like to cook, you don't know how to cook, you don't want to cook, you don't want to clean up, you spend a lot of time in restaurants. You end up becoming a slave to this because you can't escape anything because you always have one of these on you. Well, how do you get that time back? Through technology. So giving that back to your customer is like one of the best ways of showing, is of showing hospitality. You're now putting it in their control. Some of my best customers are the ones that come and sit at the counter, engage with the tablet, order their food. It's like any other platform you've experienced on the internet. Sends the order. I have these big screens that hang from the ceiling in the, in the, on the cook's line. So I've borrowed from fast food. Where most traditional restaurants have that little ticket that comes out, and the cook has to deal with that ticket. Now they just see a big screen there, and it's easier and quicker and faster for them to execute the food. So the customers I have that I love the most are the ones that come in and use that tablet, order their food. Next thing I know, I turn around, they're gone, because they're able to have their receipt emailed to them. Then on the other end, where I have customers that that's all they do is technology, multimedia. They'll flip that tablet down, and when I see them coming in, because we have such a great regular customer base, and I know where they're going to sit, I take that tablet off the table, because I know they want that human interaction. I also use another device. It's a RFID called Orderman, all over Europe. They weren't being used in the United States much at all. Again, the people were like, well, that's not hospitality, bringing all this technology in there. But what it does is they can go from table to table to table, order the food, and go get their drinks and send the food, and it's more efficient. So they're, you're trimming minutes off of an experience where you, know, you sit there, you're ready to go, you want to leave, and I'm very impatient. And you see that server monetizing another table when you're ready to go. You're like, hey, come on over here. I'm going to leave. They're like, oh, I don't care about you. You already paid. That's what happens. But now, with the technology, we've been liberated. We've been freed to do what we want, which is go and spend time with our family or our friends or be at home. Because if you're that busy and you're always on the road or you're always going out to eat, where do you want to be? You want to be at home. Technology is here. That's why we're all here. We don't have flying cars yet. And I don't really ever want to see a flying car because we suck at driving on this planet. So imagine how we'd be flying. That's really all I have. I have 37 seconds left. And my 88-year-old dad told me, if there's more than one person in a selfie, it's called an ussy. So I'm going to take an ussy with you folks, all right? You can smile. All right, folks. Thank you for your time.